Okay, due to the limited amount of time, we will start with much with not so much ado here. So let us introduce Branjo. He is replacing hey, out. replacing Martina Hanusova, who couldn't come. Then I have Jana Malechkova. Great to have you here. You sent me a very good email. I know everything I need to know. Thank you. Very good. And then I have Adam, who is the chairman of Roger, CEO. Great to have you on board. And Michal Simanski. I don't know how good my Polish is, but I'm trying. Well, I'm Swedish. Well, <laughs> new market strategy and director at Blick. This is a panel and we are going to speak about transformation of international payments. <coughs> and I also have to thank our partners for making the conference possible. And the partners include the Minister of Finance of the Slovak Republic, the National Bank of Slovak Republic, Visa, Binance, Blick, 365 Bank, and the supporters, Porto, CRIF, Slovak Credit Bureau, and FUMBI. And the expert guarantee and the expertise is provided by FINAS, which is a FinTech and InsureTech Association of Slovakia. I will actually start with Michael, Michal over there. What are the practical challenges in designing foreign exchange interoperability? You can use Blick as an example if you want. Thank you. Uh, I think that the world of international payments is really fascinating because uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of demand, uh, we have uh, high margins, and actually over the years uh, we see that uh, it is very difficult to duplicate uh, innovations on a domestic scale in international context. And uh, so there, are, there is a lot of challenges, and uh, I'd like to share with you uh, some of those challenges, practical challenges we, we faced, and Hopefully, we will overcome them, making uh, Bleak really uh, international. And uh, I, I will pick up uh, two types of payments. First is P2P payments uh, directed by telephone number. And second, e-commerce payment as an example of, of different types of POS, let's say, uh, payments. And in the first area, we definitely have uh, <clears throat> some very well working domestic solutions like Viamo in Slovakia or Blick in Poland, where you can choose a person from a telephone book, uh, know uh, the telephone number of the recipient, and uh, immediately send uh, money to the beneficiary. So, uh, theoretically, it should be very easy to duplicate that to include other countries uh, in the European Union or outside. So what I'd like to, uh, to, 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 to underline is that the devil is in the details, so it can be done, but not always it makes sense, and there are, there are some practical challenges. Uh, one of them, for example, is possibility to use different accounts. Uh, so uh, those of you who have accounts in different currencies know that uh, it is very difficult uh, just to use one account because if I'm sending money to Eurozone from Poland, uh, I may want to use my Euro account in Poland and not necessarily the Polish slot account and to pay for the conversion, which makes this much more difficult and potentially uh, also the interface will be uh, more difficult. And uh, in P2P, there is logic also of corridors. So uh, between some countries, uh, we know that the traffic will be very good in case uh, and very high. In case of Poland, it is Ukraine, for example, because a lot of Ukrainians 
uh, work and and live in in Poland. With other countries, uh, it probably the traffic will be very low. In case of e-commerce payments, uh, uh, FX uh, conversion is definitely uh, the hard part. With rates changing every second and uh, expectation that customers should accept actually the rate before making a payment. And uh, so, so it can be done using the intermediary banks. Um, that's nevertheless uh, quite, uh, quite a challenge. So there are, there are a lot of challenges, but nevertheless, I, I hope that uh, we'll uh, see more and more <coughs> domestic solutions being scaled to the international, uh, international uh, dimension. That, of course, leads me to Branio, working for Visa, that is very, very familiar with international transactions and currency conversions. I will see what you will comment on this and the future trends. Thank you. And thank you for having me in this kind of very short uh, notice. Uh, so, um, yes, uh, probably something that is uh, known to everyone is that uh, Money movement across the border is is simply growing, and it's amazing what is happening. Basically, it's uh, we see not only that we are traveling. Obviously, we are buying goods and products, services uh, from from international merchants, but as well, we see a lot of remittance. Meaning, I'm working in Poland and sending money to Ukraine because I'm sending money to to my family. Uh, so these are global globalization impacts and and we see more and more of it so the question is how we can help to to uh, basically move the money from one country to another and ideally even help uh, converting so we all know vices and revolutes of these days who actually came and and simplified this world for for consumers um, what we are doing now in visa is we realized actually we are the global network that we can use it also for sending money in much bigger amounts than just uh, let's say 500 pounds or 10,000 euros. We can actually move millions of pounds to another part. So we are now opening our network for big corporations and big money movements. So we see this, this is happening and uh, yeah, we are happy that uh, we, can, we can bring better user interfaces. Jana, are the banks doing what they should do in this area? As European market, financial market is really fragmented, so it really depends on the country. And uh, I would see the most potential now uh, if we talk about the transformation of international payments for Europe, it's the PSD2, which is the Payment Service Directive. And it's a a uh, European directive which actually makes banks obliged to share their clients' data with third-party providers who have the license. Everything, that's the financial platform that we are currently working on, has obtained such, uh, such license, fintech license, uh, in July 2021. And... Uh, I think this is the great potential for Europe. What I would like you to maybe remember from this panel discussion, that we have to go a little bit back uh, and see what was happening maybe 15 or more years ago. European financial market was really fragmented and it, it, still, it still is fragmented. So there came the uh, players with global appetite as Visa and MasterCard. I feel a bit uncomfortable now <laughs> sitting next to you. Uh, and he's laughing. He knows what I'm going to, to maybe say a bit, a bit. So basically, this payment service directive uh, came because there was lack of competition on the European market. It's back to the credit crisis that uh, we have, uh, that we can all remember from 2008 and 2009. But the payment service directive is about this that P at the beginning payments. Remember that Europe has big problem with the payments. 80% of all payment flows in Europe in retail are processed just by two foreign payment providers, Visa and Mastercard. <laughs> 
and uh, it's actually a big geopolitical problem for Europe. That's why PSD2 is here, and that's why new it was enabled on the political level to, to bring this PSD2. It was enabled to the players who maybe saw a little bit more uh, or who came out from the financial markets and, or the working for the banks who understood what's the problem. So the problem is that 80% uh, of payment flows are controlled by companies that are in different jurisdictions. So our European laws cannot be enforced like GDPR or data sharing are in different jurisdictions. So this is the problem, this is why PSD2 is here and, uh, and that's where potential is really big. Before I move on to Adam, I think uh, Branio and Visa should have a chance to reply here. Thank you. Uh, and yet, what, what I would say, Visa welcomes uh, competition. Um, but let's put aside politics. Uh, and, and sometimes we feel that, uh, uh, you know, if you go to Brussels and, and, and you discuss this discussions about the future, uh, when it comes to the politics, uh, it, 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 it is uh, irrelevant to business. So yes, if, if someone brings something great uh, to the market, and I even agree that the uh, payment service directive uh, basically brought more competition. Uh, I was in London, we were building fintech business. Uh, it was in, in imaginable to, to enter finance ecosystem or sector in the past. Now it is all possible. So this is this was good good move, uh, and and that was probably thanks to to the regulation. But uh, yeah, let's let's keep to things to business and usability and user interface. Jana, please reply. I'm not forgotten you, Adam. You're next. Yes. yes. Uh, so. Um, I would not say it's about the politics in the end. It's about the money, yeah? Because the lack of competition on our European market brings hidden challenges. These hidden challenges are high transaction costs that all the retailers would complain about. It means that they can't use, we, we talked to them before we started doing our solution. They said, I don't have any other alternative. There is only Visa or MasterCard. And then the prices are high. So I would say it's also about money that goes down then to our customers because retailers always place the prices and we have to pay it. So it's also about the users of the payments. That is true. Transactions costs are high. There is no doubt about it. I see more and more places trying to put these transaction costs on top of the customer instead you due to this problem. Yes, and not only that, uh, the long payment processes is also a problem. PSD2 brings the opportunity to, to make the transaction in real time, let's say 10 seconds. Yeah? So this is another thing. And then the third thing that I have already mentioned is the technological dependency. We could see it in Ukraine. It was just mm -hmm. mentioned before that there are many Ukrainians at the moment moving to uh, to Poland and to other countries, and they, um, yeah, so. It was difficult to bring money out of the country and getting it yeah. changed into useful currency in Slovakia and Poland and so on. I was maybe trying to point out that, you know, what has happened in Ukraine in the first days of the war, payments were not working, they were stopped. It's a geopolitical tool that we have to have it in our hands in Europe, I believe. Thank you. Adam, representing in Roger, what is your take on the issues that have been brought up so far? Well, um, so my role is to be a, um, a witness of, uh, of a fintech struggle uh, in the world of uh, international payments because uh, um, Roger doesn't have any uh, great solution how to, how to mitigate the problem. Um, uh, we, what we do, we, we finance uh, suppliers in e-commerce business. Yeah? Um, we, had a, we had a biggest thing like a check and we would like to do it somewhere else, right? Um, we 
we transact about a billion euros that we finance to the suppliers to e-commerce, telco, and logistics. And we do that in about a million transactions in a, in a year. So that's a lot of transactions, thousands and thousands of transactions every day. And uh, because we are now financing about 50% of, uh, of Czech e-commerce, we would like to go somewhere else, right? Um, so we were looking, where, we, where could we go? So we, we would like to go to Slovakia. Well, that's great. We, we do have some clients and we're very happy here. But after we, we said, well, um, there are some big e-commerce businesses in Hungary. That would be a great country to go to. Oh, brilliant. Well, I put aside that there is a 0.3 sector tax and it's really difficult and expensive to transact there. So, um, but that's, that's not my, uh, my, my, my cup of tea. Um, but it takes five days for us to send a payment from Czech Republic to Hungary in uh, 2022. Yeah, five days. And how our platform works is that on one side we have big investors like banks, we are co-owned by Societe Generale, so you can imagine who is one of the big investors financing all of that. And on the other hand, we have the suppliers. So it's like peer to peer. We get a we get a money from, from the big investor, we send it to the to the supplier. And we do that every day, all the time. So a lot of transactions. And if you if you need to wait five days here and five days there, but well, that's that's a really long time. At, and we are losing our competitive edge because we are fintech, so our edge is to be fast. And uh, so we said, oh, we are going to establish an account in Hungary. That's going to solve our, all our problems. Well, we were trying to do that for nine months and we failed because we are payment institutions. So we are regulated. No one is going to touch us because they're all scared. Um, so we said, well, that was not very successful. We go to Croatia. There is big e-commerce. We have a potential partner there. Well. After six months, we have managed to establish an account there for one of our daughter companies that is not regulated. And it's only because we didn't disclose that we, we are regulated on top, right? Uh, so it is ridiculous how complicated it is for a European <coughs> fintech to go abroad. And, uh, and even when, when Croatia is going to join SEPA, in, in January next year, is not going to solve any of our problems because SEPA is slow and it's cumbersome and sometimes it happens that it doesn't work for 12 hours or so. So if, if you have a European system that gives you a day plus one on every payment, that means that in our platform we are day minus two on every payment. And again, it's not fintech, it's not fast, it's not efficient. So. Um, that's my position. I am here to say that uh, change is needed and something has to happen because otherwise we are going to stay a very local fintech and we are not going to go anywhere. PSD2 will not solve this for you? Jana? I believe so because there is also Sepainst which enables you to have the money in 10 seconds. But I do agree very much with you about how difficult it is to open a bank account in a different European country if we want to go global as a fintech. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, there, there is Institute of, of SEPA Inst, but we are part of Societe Generale Group, so I would say that we, we do get a, like a, a perfect treatment from them. And we were like, oh, can we have this SEPA Plus? That would be great. Well, no, we can't have it. Even as an internal fintech that is supported by the group, the payment that it's not going to be sent that day till 11 o'clock is not going to arrive to our client in any other European country that day. So it is really slow and it needs improvement. I think the main problem here is that European banks that are part of all these single uh, European payment areas, SEPA, they don't trust each other. And that's why the clearing takes so much time. And uh, I don't know who has to solve it. It's not me, but I, I see that there is a problem, and maybe maybe you you can solve that. Can you? Jan or Michael, you may have. The, uh, Jan or Michael, you may have the solutions. I think so. We should talk after <laughs> this. <laughs> really, I think uh, there's some business opportunity on the stage here right now. <laughs> I I really think that what you have just described, some of the things uh, like Zepa Instant, can can be the problem solver for you. But let's take it maybe uh, out of this discussion because it's too many technical details in it. I just wanted to offer him also visa solution. So <laughs> if everyone is doing advertising here. How much? <laughs> Very cheap and instant. But it, need, it, need, it needs to be for free. That's the problem. Yeah, the, the payments need to be free. That's, that's the main problem. That's the reason why we are not using you because yeah. you are expensive. Yeah. 
and 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 so and this is this is very important. This is very important uh, because nothing is for free. Uh, let's let's keep it. Let's be honest with ourselves. If something is for free, it it's it's not there because no one is actually waking up in the morning and saying, "Okay, I love someone, and I'm going to do something for free." Um, and especially not in in financial industry. So everything has its price. Let's let's uh, even if we are talking about, and I'm talking to a lot of uh, crypto guys, uh, decentralized finance guys. So so uh, this is very uh, simple simple mathematics. And and uh, until someone will believe, uh, here was a remark that uh, that uh, something that uh, Visa and Mastercard is actually doing here is increasing price for merchants. So let me give you one very good example. Uh, last two years, uh, there was a huge push for so-called buy now, pay later. So what is buy now, pay later? Buy now, pay later is uh, you buy something from a merchant and you pay it in four, let's say four uh, installments in, in six weeks. Why six weeks? Because then it is under the radar of the regulator and therefore I don't need a, a license. So I go to merchant and I say, I will boost your merchant uh, uh, sales and, and you will pay me 2.5%. Suddenly merchants were, oh, 2.5%, okay, fine, you will boost my sales, so I'm, I'm agreeing to this. So what is it? It is simply interchange that Visa and MasterCard were applying and is regulated to 0.2 or 0.3%. So again, whole idea of buy now, pay later collapsed actually three, three, two months ago. Why? Because the business case was not there, right? We saw all Klarna's falling down from the valuations. We saw all those companies, Zilch and I don't know what other companies falling down because you need to have business model behind the story. If you don't, then it's simply just a cloud of ideas. That is, that is your main problem, that you don't have any other business model behind those transactions that you, you do. That's why you make them so expensive. So uh, how is that possible that I do transact for free yeah, on on account-to-account -account basis and you have managed to lobby not to put a cap on B2B transactions. I mean, not everyone knows that, but e-commerce businesses are paying as much as 2% on a transaction from a business card. And that is outrageous, yeah? And that is just too much. And you, you, that, that, it, there is no other value. And also, when I'm saying that you should do that for free, it's because that all the transaction that you do, there is a massive value of information. Yeah, and you should be able to, to capitalize on that. Yeah, uh, the, the, the information has a huge value. That's why so many guys like you are, are doing services on AS, AIS or account information services because there is a massive value. And I think that you should, you should look at that a bit more closely than trying to slice off 2% of every B2B transaction by card. I didn't even know how great it will be that I will join this uh, uh, this panel. So, 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 so let me give you a little bit of, of uh, introduction into what, what is so-called interchange. 
interchange is not something, and yes, you're right, for business cards, interchange is higher, but it's not something that Visa gets. And this is the whole misunderstanding of the industry. This is what the issuer of the card gets from the merchant or acquirer of that merchant as a, th as a thank you that you brought me that business into my shop. And that's how they distribute it. Uh, if you like it, again, I use this 2.5% with a buy now, pay later example. It's absolutely the same thing. So merchant is paying to issuer of the bank or to business actually 2.5%. So that bank, uh, sorry, 2%. So that bank, it could easily say to business, I'm giving you 1% cash back. Uh, of course, some banks do it, some banks don't. But this is the business. This is the business, how it works. Let's leave this topic now. As a moderator, I think we should not continue down this road too far because there's different opinions here and I don't see any reconciliation coming in anywhere anytime soon. I think there's room both for Visa and for alternative payment systems. I just hope that the alternative payment system developed quickly and will have low enough transaction costs to fit your business model, Roger. That's what I hope for here. Uh, however, what about uh, the central bank cryptocurrency? Could that be something for lowering transaction costs? We're basically using e-euros and e-dollars and e-forints uh, in lieu of cash for transactions. We can actually transact them electronically, even possibly peer-to-peer -peer without a middleman or a minimal middleman or a middleman not costing so much. So just a few thoughts on central bank cryptocurrency. So maybe I will uh, start, because that's very re relevant, I think, in that discussion, uh, both uh, in uh, the context of facilitating uh, uh, cross-border payments, because we actually saw a lot of initiative in that field, and uh, including Libra, which could change the world. We, we live in, uh, and we see that uh, it is like a nuclear power. So it is so powerful that we are actually uh, afraid uh, to make it uh, working in many cases, including Libra. And the regulations are coming uh, because that could disintermediate a whole range of companies. Uh, uh, because with digital central bank cash, it will be free of charge because the costs which will be minimal will be bared by the central bank, like for emitting the currency, printing banknotes. We are not paying for printing banknotes. And the central bank will still, still earn the seniorage from issuing the, exactly. is, issuing the money. So. Exactly. And seniorage, with, with the inflation we have at the moment, it will be more than enough to provide for the... the uh, back, background system which will uh, serve that and it will make international payments much more easier and actually China is doing that with their digital currency and the scale of this project is at the moment very high and the game is uh, that they are trying to challenge the euro as uh, the second international currency because the their currency will be fully digital and it will be easier to operate. And that's the reason, or one of the reasons, uh, we have uh, such intensive works on digital euro in, uh, in, in Europe. So that is the game changer. And I don't know if it will happen or not or when, because that depends from the regulation. And as Libra shows, it is very difficult to predict the regulation, of course, but I think that that could address both the pricing uh, part and uh, the, uh, the other difficulties in foreign payments. Digital euro are happening as we speak. The central bank is working on it, slowly but surely. Yana. I just maybe want to remark that we are most probably talking about the far future for Europe. If we, if we look at China, what they are doing, uh, the regulations in Europe are heavy. And just a remark, I would be really happy if the central bank 
banks in Europe would focus on the things that they start earlier, which is PSD2, because there are still many obstacles that they have to solve. And uh, yeah, it's good to start new projects, but also let's stay focused on the things and finish the things properly and get it implemented in the way that really helps us Europeans to, to have fast payments and secure payments, because I'm not really sure if people in China uh, feel secure about what they have to use there. I just, just forgot to add another example of those obstacles, practical obstacles with PSD2 and similar activities, not fr from my bleak experience, but uh, in Poland there is a paradox that the payment institution could obtain the sort code, the banking sort code from the national bank, but there is no possibility to participate directly or indirectly in any of the clearing systems with the, that sort code. So the, 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 the payment institution should use uh, the account number belonging to the domain of the servicing banks. So that's one of the examples that the world is not perfect still uh, in that area. Please, Adam. Yeah. Uh, would digital currency solve some of your problems in the future? I, I don't know. Um, I see one problem with the um, um, CBDCs, um, and uh, that is that it looks really nice on paper, yeah, um, and it has many, many efficiencies and all of that, but um, I'm afraid that the, the central banks don't want to have a hotline, they don't want to have um, um, internet banking, uh, they don't want to have a lot of people in branches, and that's a problem that needs to be solved, because once you are going to have a lot of people transacting on that currency, you are going to have a lot of problems, and someone needs to solve the, the problems of the, of the customers using that. So I think that's a big topic, and I would believe that the, the commercial banks should take that role for some, uh, um, for, for some reimbursement, obviously, but um, that, is a, that is a big topic that needs to be resolved. But I see something that is really amazing about, uh, uh, about uh, the, the CBDCs, and uh, that, that could be, uh, for instance, now we are fighting high inflation. In Czech, we have um, um, seven hundred uh, basis, right? Um, the, the, the euro uh, interest rate is, is rising, but the problem of our central bank, for instance, and also of the uh, ECB, is that uh, once they raise the interest rate, uh, the, the market is reacting really slowly, right? So the commercial banks are not giving investors the interest rate fast enough. They they wait, right? It, it takes really long time for the interest to raise. But when you have this um, centralized, you can, you can do that immediately. You will have much more impact on the market. So in the moment that the Czech National Bank, let's say in theory, would rise to the 7% and give to the people option to send money to some account that they would have under their ledger, they would be responsible for, and give them those 7%, people would be start saving much faster and the reaction on the, on, the, on the regulatory monetary policies would be much, much faster. And I think that would be a huge benefit going forward, but there are some issues that need to be solved. Thank you. And also when it comes to cross-border transaction, knowing your customer or the kick becomes much more difficult. How are you dealing with that at Visa? Sorry. Knowing your customer, when dealing with cross-border transaction to avoid money laundering and such issues. So obviously, uh, AML, we all know those shortcuts, KYC, KYB, AML. So um, this is obviously very important in our business in, in finance and uh, we are putting, uh, and banks actually, we, we don't do there too much, uh, but they, banks do, of course, uh, whenever you are sending money and receiving money. Uh, and we had this discussion just earlier uh, today that uh, the, the weird thing is that it is slightly different and sometimes uh, country by country and sometimes actually home country um, uh, fintech players uh, can be this, this uh, disadvantage to foreigners that come here because, for example, if someone is uh, regulated by a Latvian national bank, 
is actually responsible uh, by, by geolocation to Latvian uh, regulator, while here in Slovakia the, the fintech is responsible towards Slovakian regulator, and therefore there are some variances which disadvantage those guys, and I think we need to work uh, to, to mitigate this. And I think it's just simple, you know, you have to go and we are back to politicians, I'm sorry, but really it's a KYC, in uh, if you are a Slovak fintech and you, you really have to do the know your customer processes, which means that you have to ask who you are, uh, show us your ID and, and everything, then there is another competitor from, uh, from other country and that competitor just comes and doesn't really ask for IDs and so on. Uh, so I really feel discriminated here in this place, but it's our thought that, our thought, uh, that we are not able to change the laws, you know, because we just say, oh no, you can't do this because it's the law. Well, but uh, the world outside is a bit different. Let's look how they have it, how they, how they approach the QICs, and let's innovate also our legislation. So this is on our shoulders, I would say. Will not the Mika help here? Who? Uh, so. When it comes to regulation of cryptocurrency, at least. Uh, new um, I mean, currently, everybody who wants to register some cryptocurrency goes through Lithuania for obvious reasons. But now on the European level, we're going to get Mika, which is, uh, should have the same regulation throughout the Union, at least when it comes to cryptocurrency and such transactions. Yeah, but have you ever tried crypto and have you ever tried to transfer some crypto? It's so difficult. I mean, if you just change one number in that, then it goes somewhere else. So I think... First, UX is important to be solved, and it will take some more time until crypto comes as well uh, in, in our daily lives. Uh, and there will be some other ways that we will pave the path for crypto. I really believe that it's a great, uh, great tool uh, to handle payments, but it's so difficult to, I mean, have you ever tried it? I bought bitcoins, and if my husband didn't uh, didn't uh, was not an IT expert, I wouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> well, we're not there yet that we're using cryptocurrency with daily transactions, obviously. But they said it's five years in the future. In five years, maybe they say it's five years in the future again. We will see. Yeah, of course. What we are witnessing now, and I think. It is we are getting there um, is uh, off ramp and on ramp is something that uh, Visa is looking closely at and then we are partnering with Coinbase and basically what we allow is to you can load your your from your fiat uh, uh, currency you can load your uh, crypto wallet and then obviously once you're topping post terminal it automatically through the API basically converts from crypto into into that fiat currency. I know this is just the first stage. And potentially in the future, there'll be a merchant and acquirer that will accept cryptocurrency and it will not go through that fiat conversion. Uh, but yeah, this is where we are and where we are heading. Jana. I would say that it's the question of the use cases that you can find in your life, daily life. Why to use crypto? Well, we just played a bit with Bitcoin and maybe some other. Uh, but there are also already known use cases where crypto is... Uh, I, I, can, I can recollect, uh, we, we, uh, we did some market uh, research uh, back then and there was a British guy who we had in the in an interview. He had uh, he had uh, his wife was from Russia, and they lived in Crimea. And they told me that he told me that once Crimea was invaded, all the payments were shut down, and he had to convert his British pounds to crypto, and then crypto to. Russian currency. So, yes, if we 
If we think about the use cases in our daily life, I'm sure we will find them. And then let's start on that. And maybe this is how it creep. You know, for I see crypto now. Like, okay, this is it's more for tech people. First, they really need to know how to how to obtain it. It's not really easy. But then, if we are really finding the use cases in real life, then it will be easier to adopt it in and go and go with that. Thank you, Jana. We're a bit short of time here, so I would like last comments on cross-border transactions, what you see in the near future and the future, and what you think should be done. We start over there at the other end with Michael. So I definitely think that uh, the CBDCs uh, and digital currencies should be observed because in the long term that uh, can be a game changer and uh, we hope very much that uh, it will be possible to scale up to European level uh, some domestic solutions like Blick, that's uh, our aim. And we see also the big interest of uh, ECB and European Commission in the further promoting of instant payments, SCT Inst, and uh, using uh, that in even more contexts of uh, instant payments. And I think that's the interesting discussion. We'll see if uh, there will be a potential of uh, moving money faster in relation to um, POS, e-commerce payments, with merchants being credited more frequently and faster. There is a question mark if it is really necessary, but potentially can, it can be done. So that's from our side. And regarding the Bitcoin and that's true, transactions are not uh, easy and I have mixed view, my personal um, mixed view because many years ago I bought one Bitcoin when it costed around 300 uh, euros and I spent a lot of that just testing different transactions and after 15 years it appears that it was definitely the most expensive air ticket I bought because when I would keep this Bitcoin I could fly around the world probably for the price of the ticket to Amsterdam. So definitely it's a lot of hype and a lot of speculations on the digital currencies at the moment. Adam, please. All right, um, um, I will keep my fingers crossed for you. Uh, so you, you're successful because that's, that's going to help us. Um, I definitely think that um, um, ECB should work on, uh, on instant payments. Uh, uh, it is ridiculous that we have day plus one uh, within EU. I think that, that there should be a big discussion about what are we going to do with the countries that did not accept Euro, because uh, five days transfer, international transfer within Europe also is ridiculous. That is absolutely no go going forward. So those are the main things that uh, uh, worry me, and we are going to try to be as loud as possible in Czech FinTech Association and and um, yeah, um, just to, to raise this and um, um, get, get a solution for it, because I, I think that um, if you want to have a European successful big fintechs, um, these rails are, are needed. Um, I don't want to speak about crypto. Uh, my only comment will be that they have missed up crypto, missed a huge chance uh, on the beginning of this horrible conflict that we would expect maybe that it would be a, a, something that could help some people, but um, on the other hand, it has behaved as any other small tech company. Um, it dropped massively, and I think uh, that uh, that has shown us um, um, a bit uh, bit better the potential of it. So I'm not a massive fan, and uh, that, that, that's it for the crypto. Thank you very much. Yana? As my domain is Again, as you understood, PSD2 or open banking. Um, we see that um, the data that banks are sending to us are not in a good quality yet. It means two things. Uh, banks should really improve. They should admit that we are, they should, they should, I would wish they would understand the situation with the data because they play a big role in, in that, that we can keep the data in Europe. 
for that, they really need to work on the quality of these data. And if they are not able to accept that, then the regulators should help them <laughs> with that. And it's another problem uh, in Europe that I see that every central bank, it's usually when we talk to those central banks, when we see some PSD2 issues, we see the lawyers there. There are no technical guys. And so they are so, we are so much struggling to explain the problem. So it would be great if all the national regulators would make their PSD2 frameworks, processes, and if they get a PSD2 issued as a uh, reported by the third party, they should have a process and a deadline when the issue will be solved. I think that's really easy again. <laughs> so fingers crossed for Europe. Okay, so uh, I would agree to my predecessors that uh, we need to improve, right? We, uh, we see the demand for instant payments, cross-currency payments, but we see also demand of maybe later payments, right? So this is exactly, we need to listen to the customers. Consumers or retail customers, business customers, we need to listen to their needs. And this is why, why, why fintechs are great, basically, because they are very good in, in, in listening and, and actually bringing those solutions alive. So uh, what, what, of course, from my point of view, small, small fintechs or big fintechs, it doesn't matter. Whoever brings actually a solution that is useful for uh, end users, uh, uh, it's, it's fine. Of course, Visa is super interested in, in this space not only card payments, but also money transfers. And we have some nice solutions for small and big uh, fintechs. So yeah, this is, this is the future, uh, being able to serve consumer needs. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody in the panel. We have a few minutes for questions. Anybody have any questions here in the audience? Please, no questions? Such controversial topics as international transactions. Hello. I would have a question to uh, Visa. Uh, maybe if you can share uh, what is the vision and strategy of Visa after they do you have taken over Tink, the PSD to uh, open banking company? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the uh, for the question. Uh, I saw this in your eyes even when we met before. So yes, uh, today I'm here as a Visa. Yes, Visa, uh, and and this is again something that is uh, a little bit, uh, I would say, pushed to the public that Visa bought, Visa acquired, and so on and so forth. So so obviously uh, we are investing in the companies that are um, interesting. Uh, it doesn't mean that we need to necessarily just uh, buy full stake in, in, in the company. Uh, so we, if we see that the technology has legs, uh, we believe that it will help uh, consumers and the business, then, then we invest into this. So we think, uh, you know, the probably better than me, uh, where they come from, they, they were quite successful in the region. Um, uh, we know that uh, open banking is super uh, successful in Nordics. And and yeah, we we see this expanding, and we want we want uh, we see a lot of solutions for the for the business. I mentioned today here that uh, risk assessment is is one of them. Uh, we want if we want to make things cheaper for people, we need more data to assess the people's risks, transaction risk, fraud, and so on and so forth. So so we are building. Uh, like Google, they are building their business on the data. We are building our business on the data and we want to uh, provide fintech partners and fintech companies as good information as possible to, to price products and services as little as they can. Any more questions? We have time for one more question. Anyone? If there is no more question, then I would like to thank the panel I think we learned a lot 
about the obstacles and difficulties with international transactions. Hopefully, we will have the solutions in the near future. Maybe PSD2, when fully implemented with correct data, is a good start. Maybe we need something more. Maybe cryptocurrency will be the answer. Maybe digital euros will be the answers. Time will tell. So I would like to thank Branio that was so nice to join the panel on a very short notice and no time for preparation. Thank you, Jan, you have great insight in PSD2. Thank you, Adam, that is really looking for cheap transactions. And thank you, Michael, it was great to have you on the panel.